Pat Conahan, thanks very much for joining us tonight. This is my series, my attempt to let people see new politicians, but not in the hurly burly of the parliament or an adversarial, uh, you know, discussion or debate. I want to know the motivations that got you out of the legal profession, out of policing, to 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 run for the seat of Cowper and obviously to win it. Um, what made you run for parliament? I tell people there was a couple of reasons and um, in my maiden speech I, I was very clear that I was fairly angry not just at our side but also the other side of politics. In It, it appeared that celebrity had slipped into politics and, and ego and uh, self-interest and as a, I still consider myself the average punter. Mm -hmm. um, as an average punter, someone who got up early every morning and worked hard all day and then came home and paid tax and, uh, and, and with my family, I, I found that, um, I found it offensive to be personally honest um, and that was one of the reasons that, that I was continuously yelling at the television. My wife was saying to me, well if you think you can do better, stand up and have a go and so that was one of the reasons that I, I, I did it. The other reason and, and more so getting towards the election was just the, the lunacy that people were talking about, uh, about you know, electric cars and 100% renewables and um, removing franking credits. Um, after the election, I had uh, an elderly gentleman come up to me in the street and give me a hug, and he was literally crying that he got to keep about $4,000 a year um, because we kept Labor out and we didn't touch the franking credit system, you know, and and that really hit home. So it was it was twofold. Just the 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 craziness of of losing um, what our centre was, and it, it felt like I I woke up in a different universe when all these things were happening. But fortunately, we we didn't have to face that. I mean, there was a lot of um, very big policies that Labor took to the election. Yeah. Um, and a lot of them, even one of those policies by themselves, franking credits or negative gearing changes, would have been seismic. But right across the board, there was a real sense of relief, palpable relief, even if people had not been long-term coalition supporters. Now, this was your first election. You now represent the seat of Cowper. It picks up parts of Port Macquarie, parts of Coffs Harbour. It's up in the north coast of New South Wales. It's sort of God's own country. If you drive through it, as I have many times, it's resort-like holiday sort of country but you've got a lot of retirees and you have a real hidden scourge of youth unemployment you're really determined to get into that issue aren't you I am and and the the youth unemployment particularly in Coffs Harbour is uh, around the 20.3 percent now big, isn't it? that's huge that's that's almost double the national average and it's almost double that of Port Macquarie which is in the electorate but only 150 kilometers away so that was something I campaigned on. I don't, I don't have the answer for that, but what I've done is put together a uh, committee to work towards a, a youth employment summit. Now that committee consists of myself and several, seven other members from the Lands Council, from retail, from industry, from university schools, uh, and, uh, and I think I said retail, but um, just across the board um, to frame the committee, frame the working policy for that summit. So that's coming up in the next couple of weeks and then we'll put it out to um, the whole of Coffs Harbour to say come along to this summit, it'd be fantastic to have a thousand people there to put it into the melting pot and work out firstly why we're in this position, why we're Port Macquarie and Coffs Harbour are almost identical in topography, in um, industry, but why there's that disparity. So throw all that into the, the melting pot and, and work out why it's happening and how we can solve it and where the jobs are going to be in the next five or 10 years. And that way we can work towards it and hopefully significantly reduce that unemployment. Now people at home watching this tonight won't be surprised that you come only matters of months into the job with a practical solution to a problem that's obviously long standing. Um, because you used to be a policeman, 
Yes. Uh, you then went on to a legal career, but yeah. for a good stretch of your life as a young person, a young man, uh, you wore the uniform. We often talk about sort of the public service mm. of being an MP, but there's a real public service there for anyone who wears a uniform. Yeah. Um, the policeman and, and the lawyer in you that took on politics, one of the big issues we talk about in regional communities is the scourge of uh, illicit drugs. Mm. ICE in particular has really ravaged country towns. I'm from the bush myself. I, I know how hard it's hit country areas. What's it like for you as an issue? Well, ICE is the ugliest drug of them all. There's no doubt about that. And, and I have to say... It's so violent. Too. It is. And, and, and so quick. So quick to change somebody um, into um, from a, from a normal person com uh, contributing to the community to somebody who's not a not only a drain on perhaps the welfare system but the mental health system, uh, unemployment, the um, health system itself, mm -hmm. all those issues. And I and I spoke about it in my maiden speech that uh, 12 years in the police, I had five years in the drug enforcement agency, and I saw firsthand what drugs generally, but in particular ice, n not only do to a person, but have the impact on that person's family, their loved ones, and, and across, particularly per across uh, rural and regional communities because you see it um, happen before your eyes. So this is political, it's state politics of course, but this whole debate about harm minimisation and saying that you know we've basically lost the fight, we might as well give it up, test the drugs at these dance parties uh, and let the kids have a free-for-all. Where do you stand on that issue? That's rubbish. We, we cannot uh, legalise drugs. We can't do it. We can't throw our hands up and say, well, there you go. Pill testing doesn't work. None of those kids died because they took one pill. They died because they took numerous pills. It was 40 degrees. There wasn't adequate uh, medical services. Pill testing is a waste of time. If we uh, accede now to the minority and say, well, let's consider legalisation through legislation, then we might as well just open the borders. We might as well just let it go. Uh, and what you will see is particularly our communities, our rural communities, um, just, I'll be honest, yeah, go down the toilet. And why do you think there's not enough attention on the people that run these big dance parties? Why do they seem to be getting off scot-free? We know that they make many millions of dollars from organising these events. We heard the horror stories of the event up uh, north, up not far from you, where there was one doctor uh, for a whole weekend long festival and very little uh, mobile phone coverage, so no capacity for this doctor who was not experienced to be able to call in resources. Why are we chasing down that part of the equation? Well, it is twofold. First they are making a lot of money and they should have a responsibility placed on them to make sure there's adequate security uh, and adequate, adequate medical attention. But then there's that argument that there is a personal responsibility. Um, again, in my maiden speech, we have to have a national, strategic national education approach. We need to to target our youngest of children. Now people might say, well you can't, you can't put confronting images on television for 8, 9, 10, 11 year olds. That's exactly what we have to do. Mm. Because the ones who are 18, 19, 20, who have decided to take drugs and didn't die because they only took one, say, well that's okay, it's, I can take drugs. But if you show the younger generation those really confronting photographs of somebody who um, takes ice and then six months later there's a photo of them and, a, a, and what uh, you know we had the the um, grim reaper campaign and people were saying oh that's terrible but it worked mm -hmm. now we have to do that we have to target our kids i tell my children they're 10 and 12 i tell them and i've i showed them those photos to say this is what's happened i mean they've seen me over the last 20 years as a, as a lawyer, they've seen me talking about these, or heard me talking about these things anyway, um, and talking about people going to jail, etc. But until you actually see uh, how confronting, not only just the images, but what it does to families, um, we really need to concentrate on that. You get a lot of retirees, uh, people on fixed incomes living in your electorate. How hard's cost of living increase has been for your community? It has been hard. There is absolutely no doubt. There's um, over 27% uh, of people in Port Macquarie are over the age of 65. 
aged pensioners, and, and they've been telling me, look, the bills are going up, it's, it's hard to su survive on the aged pension, mm -hmm. uh, similarly those on Newstart. Uh, it's definitely something that we need to look at, um, but we really have to be fiscally responsible as a government. That's the most important thing. I mean, first, first budget surplus in 11 years. It's time that we looked after the budget and then we can concentrate on those issues such as aged care and such as New Start. What surprised you since you've come down to Canberra? What has surprised me is uh, generally People are extremely friendly, um, they're just normal people, uh, happy to talk to you, happy to impart advice. I certainly, I expected to be over, overwhelmed uh, by the work um, and by the change in, in occupation, but I feel like I've stepped into a comfortable pair of slippers. Yeah, well you're, you've been in a job really that's been serving people for a long time, so you can see that there's some complementarity. Uh, before we go, I can't not ask you, I, I was reading some biographical notes and I found it fascinating that when you were an undercover cop, a detective, you met your wife undercover. That's extraordinary. Tell me more. Well, what, what, what can you tell me actually? Well, I, that is true. I, I had two years as a full-time operative in the Drug Enforcement Agency, so I looked quite di different. I had long hair and a, a goatee and, and earrings. Um, um, and I just happened to meet my wife, not on a job, but uh, I met my wife and uh, we were chatting and exchanged numbers. So it was a little bit interesting telling her that my real name wasn't the name I'd told her. And, um, but uh, it's something we laughed about. happily married and got a couple of kids. So yeah, they must have worked. 20 years later. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for your time. All the best uh, for the future. And uh, I will come back to you. I'd love to talk to you a bit more about this youth summit. It's something that I'm sure doesn't affect just Cowper. It's right across the board now other electorates. So all, all credit to you and I hope it works out well, but I'll come back and see how it went. It'd be a pleasure. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Pat.